your cell phones if you haven't done that yet so that we're not disturbed by those during our worship. Uh, and also be sure to pick up a newsletter from the foyer. There's a lot of information in there that might be helpful to you. Uh, on our prayer list, uh, be sure to include uh, Sonny Parker. He's been going through some uh, terrible health problems and Lynn has been taking good care of him. And so pray for Sonny and Lynn Parker. Also Lois and Mike Fletcher continue to be on our prayer list. Lois is uh, shut in at home with incurable cancer and our prayers are with her and those waiting upon her. Brother Steve Hayes told me that he hoped to be back this morning but he had a setback over Thanksgiving. Uh, tried to do too much I think and his lungs are suffering because of that and so remember Brother Hayes in your prayers and pray for him. Also Karen Brady suffered a fall at home and broke one foot and the other ankle. She told me she had a splint on one side and a boot on the other. And so pray for her uh, as she recovers. Also, we've been praying for Virgil and Patricia's story. Uh, Mike Smith and his uh, crew are back from Texas. It's good to see some of them here. I think Mike is home resting up this morning. They got in at 5 a.m. So remember that. Uh, remember all those fellas. Uh, also, I've got uh, a note in here. Uh, pray for peace in Israel and Ukraine. Uh, anywhere where there's fighting and, and people dying, uh, of course, pray for, uh, pray that peace will abound. Uh, also, uh, I mentioned uh, to some of you already about the Low Income Housing Assistance uh, Energy Assistance Program. Uh, the, the time to uh, sign up for that is December the 1st. That is a program for people of a certain income range that are over 65 and they help pay your electric bill. And so if you're interested in that, you can see Brian for details. You can see me. Uh, we're going to need some information from you by December the 1st in order to sign up for that. Uh, also, we'll have a brief meeting this morning after the closing prayer. Uh, again, about our marriage retreat coming up in the Great Smoky Mountains in February. Uh, some information about the cabin and uh, the deposits and things. And so uh, stay for a brief meeting after the closing prayer this morning. Also, you'll notice in the bulletin that the Lawsons uh, will host our annual uh, open house on Thursday, December the 14th. The time will be 6 to 9 p.m. and it will be a come and go uh, occasion and all are invited. And so I hope that you'll come out to open house this year. Also, you may have seen some of the pictures on the big screen beforehand. We helped uh, Emmanuel George and his wife, Mona Lee, travel to Singapore for the Four Seas uh, Lectureship at the Four Seas Bible College. Uh, and so he was able to meet the staff and students of ACU while there. And so we're proud of that. Uh, thanks for donating to the pantry. We've helped several people out of there recently, and there is still a list of needed items to restock our pantry if you're interested in bringing those items in. I think that's everything that I have right now. If you have other things that you'd like for me to announce, I'll be happy to do that at the appropriate time. If you have anything that you'd like running the newsletter, let me know about that as well, and I'll see if I can squeeze that in for you. Then we'll turn it back over to our song leader. Great. These are new. People came oh, back okay. Just look different. Okay, we've got some new, uh, some new com communion supplies. They're new and uh, and fresh. They just look a little different than the old ones. Number five hundred. Five hundred. <laughs> Oh, I found out every blessing in my heart to sing thy praise. Sing the mercy never ceasing of our songs of loudest praise. Teach me never to adore thee. May Fills my heart with 
Today's scripture reading will be read from Hebrews 11, verses 23-26. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents, because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. Let's pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful for this time we have to come together and worship you. We're thankful that in your wisdom you gave us what it is to worship you in a pleasing way. We ask that we would be truly worshiping in spirit and in truth, that you would be with us, our attitudes, our minds, help us to be focused on what we're doing here and recognizing that it is for you. We're thankful that it is also edifying to us. It's wonderful to see all those who are able to be here. And we're just thankful, Father, that you gave us this church family. Father, we ask that you would be with the leadership of our government here and on the national level, and that you would be with the leadership of the governments around the world. We ask that you would help these conflicts in Israel and Ukraine to come to a peaceful end. Father, we ask that uh, you would help us to be supportive in this country and to remember to be prayerful to you, knowing that you are, you are the one who is in control, Father. There are many who are sick, and Father, we ask that you would be with Lois Fletcher, and be with Mike, be with Steve Hayes, please be with Karen Brady, with Virgil and Patricia, and also with... Sonny Parker and Lynn as she helps and tends to him. We're thankful for all the many, Father, who have made so many improvements. We ask that you would continue to be with them as they recover. Father, we ask that as we go out into the world each day, so many going back to school and work this week as well, that you would help us to be a shining light, that you would help us to be the kind of examples that you would have us to be that you would help us to be bold and courageous in speaking the truth, and that we would speak the truth in love, recognizing that what we do here on this earth is with our eye toward eternity. And we ask that you would help us to think that way and to set our mind on things above and to have our treasures above. As we continue to worship you, we ask that you would help us once again to truly focus on the reason we're here. We thank you for the many blessings you've given, most of all for your son and his sacrifice. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Turn to number 328. 328. The same verses 1, 2, and 4.
often zoom in and focus on one aspect relating to the Lord's Supper. And that's good, that's something that we should do, it's appropriate, but this morning, I would like us to take a step back and try to see the bigger picture. In Psalm 147, verse 5, God tells us that His wisdom is infinite. We serve an all-knowing, all-powerful God, a God who knew before the foundation of the world that man would sin and that we would need to be able to restore that covenant relationship with him. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 tells us that he chose us in him. God had a plan for our salvation before he created us, before the foundation of the world. And what a magnificent plan it was. It's a plan that we can see as early as Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where he said that man would bruise the serpent's head, and the seed of man would bruise the serpent's head, and he would bruise his heel. We see it later in the Abrahamic promise that his seed would bless all nations of the world. We see it in the prophecies of Isaiah and in the Psalms, countless prophecies. A magnificent plan that was over 2,000 years in the making. The calling out of a nation, all to bring Christ to us so that we could be in Him. Read, turn with me, if you will, to Philippians chapter 2. I'd like to read verses 5 through 7. <clears throat> it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant that was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Verse 7 where it says, but he made himself of no reputation, the American standard says he emptied himself. So our Lord left the glory of heaven and he became a man. That's a sacrifice in itself. But then he endured being beaten, spit upon, and finally nailed to a cross to pay the ultimate price. Not for his own transgressions, because 1 Peter chapter 2 says that he did no sin. How blessed we should feel that an all-knowing creator knew we would need salvation. He planned it before the foundation of the world, and he carried out that plan by paying the ultimate price being obedient even unto death. What an awesome, risen Savior we serve. Bow with me as we bless the bread. Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you especially at this time for the sacrifice that was made for us, the price that was paid for our transgressions, that we could be reconciled to you and that we could have a covenant relationship with you. We thank you for that offering of your own Son we thank you, Lord. We pray that you'll be with us and that as we partake of his body, that we do it in a worthy manner, in a way that's pleasing in your eyes, and that we can remember that sacrifice, and that we humble ourselves and, and can be servants in the way that you would want us to. In Christ's most holy and precious name, amen. Bow with me for the cup also. Dear Heavenly Father, we now remember the blood and the sacrifice. Again, we pray that we do so in a worthy manner, in a way that's pleasing in your eyes, that we can remember that sacrifice and remember that we didn't have to pay the price for our transgressions. We thank you for your Son. In Christ's name, amen. I think it's, it's important to take a notice and recognize that that does conclude the Lord's Supper and that we're entering into a separate part of our worship. And that's the giving portion. I would like to read 1 Peter chapter 4. As we discuss that. Be 
reading verses, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. It says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever. Amen. No, that's not what we normally read during this portion of our worship, but I would like to point out that charity or love will cover a multitude of sins. In this world, God uses man to accomplish his will, specifically his church. Galatians, Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 tells us to do, do good unto all. <coughs> See, we're a light in a dark world. The church is to be a city on a hill. And much of the good work that is accomplished in God's kingdom is done through the contribution that we give every Lord's day. Bow with me for the contribution. Dear Most Heavenly, dear, dear Heavenly Father, we pray that as we give, we do so cheerfully that the funds collected would go towards furthering your word and helping those in need and accomplishing your will. We pray that you'll be with us always. In Christ's most holy and precious name, amen. amen. Mark in your book, number 529. 529, be a son of encouragement. 529. Four lesson, let's sing number 391. 391. In the pill I the will, sickness break and true. In the pipe or the right, I would dare and do. Spend my days in thy praise, all the journey through. Let me live, oh, to each day. Let me live, oh, to thee. Let me hop, 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 way. Let me live close to thee. Let me walk close to thee each day. Not the glory now that the world might see. I would work, never sure, blessed Lord, for thee. But to know where I go, where my soul is free. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me live close to thee. Guide me up, 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 the way. Let me live close to thee. Let me walk close to thee each day. Help me back and to share some poor pilgrim's love. Be my friend to the end. Of the toadstone road, I will sing to my king in the soul of road. Let me live close to thee each day. Let me live close to thee. Guide me up, up, up the way. Let me live close to thee. Let me walk close to thee each day. Well, what a blessing it has been here already this morning. We're so thankful that you are here to join in with us as we strive to worship God in spirit and in truth. And what a great way to start out with uh, such a good 
uh, meditation on the Lord's Supper. We appreciate Brother Austin for doing that. That may be his first time doing it, but he did a fantastic job, and we appreciate that and look forward to uh, years and years and years of his service here to the church in, at Adairsville. We're so grateful for him and his good family. You know, there are uh, occasions where we are all called upon for leadership. We might think about, of course, the elders being the leaders of the church, and I appreciate the wonderful job that they do. Uh, the deacons lead in the area of their, uh, of their responsibility, and they uh, can draft others to help them, and they become great leaders in the church as well. As Bible class teachers, we have a great responsibility to lead others in the study of God's Word, and we're thankful for that opportunity as well. Even as a preacher, in a limited sense, uh, I lead the congregation in the study of God's Word when I'm up here to preach. Uh, we as husbands are called to uh, offer leadership in the home and the ladies are leaders among the uh, in the home among the children and in other realms as well and so there is so much to learn when we study the word of god about leadership and this morning i want to focus in on one particular character in the old testament one man who was known as a great leader of god and that is the man moses he was one of history's great leaders and left a lot of lessons behind for us to learn from. And so what can we learn when we look at the life of Moses about uh, the qualities of great leadership? Number one, I want to notice that the Bible goes out of its way to point out that Moses was a man of meekness and humility. He was a man of meekness and humility. A lot of times we think about leaders uh, as sort of uh, alpha males who throw their weight around and boss others around. But leadership involves a lot more than somebody throwing their weight around. A true leader, a great leader, is one that is humble and realizes that uh, he didn't get where he was by himself. And Moses was certainly that way. Numbers chapter 12 and verse number 3 has always been interesting to me because I believe it was written by Moses himself. Uh, the Pentateuch was uh, written by Moses. God used Moses to write these books. And yet it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. Numbers 12 and verse number 3. So you might think to yourself, well, that's a little strange for Moses to write that about himself and sort of pop his own suspender straps about how meek he was but that was God writing through Moses and so he was just recording the words that God told him to record and so what that tells us is God wants us to know how meek Moses was now meekness of course is not the same as weakness uh, weak, meekness is strength under control and leaders have got to be able to control themselves as they lead in whatever, whatever realm uh, God has called upon them to be leaders. So it was humility, among other things, that allowed Moses to be molded by God. And despite his uh, great success, he still followed God's instructions every step of the way. And so he, didn't, uh, he wasn't lifted up with a sense of pride, as far too many leaders are, but instead recognize humility and meekness in his own life. And so I think there's a lot to learn about Moses and his meekness as it applies to leadership today, whether it's in the church or in the home or in the workplace or in the school system or wherever it is that we are called upon to serve. We need to never be lifted up and think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, but instead be humble, uh, be meek, like Moses was meek. In the next place, I want you to notice that Moses was also a man of great vision. One of the uh, comments that I read about Moses was that he was one who wisely learned from the past and yet was very engaged in the present for the purpose of being prepared for the future. And so past, present, and future Moses was concerned about what was going to happen on down the line. 
We can't be worried about just today. Now, we live in today, and the choices that we make today, the actions that we take, have a real consequence. But the purpose as great leaders is to think, what about tomorrow? What about the future? And Moses was certainly concerned about that, wasn't he? I remember in Deuteronomy chapter 32, when Moses was sort of coming down to the end of his time on planet earth, he was uh, encouraging the children of Israel in sort of, his, uh, in sort of some of his final speeches here. And this passage says, Moses made an end of speaking all these words to Israel, and he said unto them, Set your hearts unto all the words which I testify among you this day, which ye shall command your children to observe to do all the words of this law. For it is not a vain thing to you, because it is your life. And through this thing ye shall prolong your days in the land, whether ye go over Jordan to possess it. Moses says, don't just think about yourself, think about your children. And don't just think about where you are now, but think about what it's going to be like when you cross over the Jordan and live in the land of Canaan. You know, Moses never was able to go into the land of promise. God, uh, God took him home before the children of Israel went into the land of Canaan. And yet... Moses was still concerned about getting them, the people, God's people, ready for the future. And that's really the mark of a great leader, isn't it? I heard not too long ago about an eldership that was meeting together to talk about their five-year plan, their 10-year plan, their 25-year plan, and their 100-year plan for the church where they were, where they were laboring. You know, that, that takes some vision to wonder where's this church going to be in 25 years. But imagine, what is this church going to look like in 100 years? If the Lord tarries, uh, God's people will still be meeting here, chances are. And so, what is the church going to look like? That is shaped, at least in part, by the things that we teach and the actions that we take and our attitudes. And real leaders know that. And so Moses was... A man of humility and meekness, but also a man of great vision. You know that passage that Eli read for us so well in Hebrews chapter 11. When he talks about Moses there, uh, he says that Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That shows that he wasn't thinking about how things feel right now. He wasn't thinking about the joys of sin that you can have for just a little while when you're engaged in them. He was thinking about what's it going to be like later because the Bible says, verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. You see, even if we never become leaders, in the way that Moses was, we need to take the long view and think about eternity, don't we? Moses was a man who could say no to sin so that he could say yes to heaven. And in order to do that, you've got to play the long game. That's what we need to do as God's people today. Have vision for the future and not just think about today. Number three, a great quality of leadership that we see in Moses is his compassion and concern for others. You know, we talked about leaders who throw their weight around and seem to only think about themselves. You know, it's, it's sad that we see that a lot in our politics here in this country, don't we? We see these people that make it up to Congress or make it to the Senate or even to the presidency and they're concerned about lining their own pockets. They go up there poor or in debt and they somehow get super rich while they're up there. Why is that? Because they're looking out for number one and not doing like Moses and thinking about others first. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 32, verses 31 and 32, Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin 
And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. See, Moses came down from the mountain and saw the people acting in a way that they needed to be destroyed, but he begged God to have mercy on the children of Israel. And he said, if you're not going to show them mercy, don't show me mercy either. Blot me out of your book too. You know, Moses was a shrewd negotiator, wasn't he? He was going to bat for the children of Israel. He was going to bat for the people of God and interceding on their behalf, mediating uh, on their behalf to the God of heaven. And because of that, God gave the children of Israel another chance over and over and over again. And why did Moses do that? He did that because of his compassion, because of his caring nature for those people that he was leading. You have to care about the people that you're leading or you'll never be a great leader like Moses. So he had this compassionate concern for others. What about us? Do we think about the people that we have an influence on? Do we think about the people that we lead, whether it's the congregation we oversee or the, uh, the classes that we teach or whatever area of leadership we're engaged in? Do we think about the people that we're leading in their best interests? <laughs> Moses did, and because of that, his name rings out through history as one of the great leaders of God's people, partly because of his compassion. In the fourth place, Moses was a man who had tremendous tenacity. You think about all the difficulties that he suffered. Just the physical problems of leading the children of Israel through a rugged and uh, difficult uh, environment to try to get them from Egypt to the promised land. Egypt was a place where they enjoyed fish and produce and the wonderful things that they had down there. And Canaan was a land that flowed with milk and honey. But the place in between was pretty dry, pretty desolate, pretty rugged. It was a place that, that tested them every day. And I suppose they could have given up. They wanted to on many occasions. Several times they said to Moses, why would you bring us out here to die? Let's turn around and go back to Egypt. But Moses continually led them on and never gave up. Besides the physical problems and uh, obstacles of leading the children of Israel to the land of Canaan, what about the other obstacles? What about the spiritual obstacles? What about the murmuring and complaining? What about the sinful rejection of God over and over again that Moses saw in the children of Israel? You know, on one occasion, they were right on the precipice of taking the land of Canaan. They had already sent spies into the land to check it out. And they sent 12 spies in and 10 of them came back and said, yes, it's great. There, uh, it is a land of milk and honey and they brought a, a bunch of grapes so big they had to carry it on a pole between two people when they came back. They said, oh, it is fantastic. But there are giants in the land and we're like grasshoppers in their sight and there's no way we can win. Of course, Joshua and Caleb were there on hand to say, we need to go right now and take that land. God is on our side. We're on God's side. And so there's no way we can lose. But the people listened to the ten instead of listening to Joshua and Caleb. And because of that, God caused them to wander for 40 more years in the wilderness. And that whole generation had to die except for Joshua and Caleb in order to enter into the promised land. If there was ever a time to give up, that might have been a good one. But Moses said, no, we're going to press on. We're going to keep on, we're going to keep on being God's people. We're going to keep on obeying this law that he's given us. We're going to keep on being faithful. And those that die in the wilderness are just going to have to die and go on to paradise. He said, we are not giving up. Moses was one who persevered through opposition. Uh, Exodus chapter uh, 17, verse number 1 says, For they were departed from Rephidim and were come to the desert of Sinai. And uh, further on it says, There he built an altar and twelve pillars according to the twelve tribes of Israel. Despite great hardships and rebellion, Moses pressed on 
in completing God's call. Remember back at the burning bush when God said, I want you to go back to Egypt and deliver my people from Pharaoh. Pharaoh had already started cracking down on them as slaves and was brutal to them. And God said, they're headed for the land of Canaan. They're not going to have to stay there and, and suffer as slaves. I'm going to deliver them out. And he told Moses to go back and Moses came up with several excuses and God took every one of them away from him. From that point on, Moses lived his life to fulfill that mission that he had to be a great leader for God's people. And even when times got tough and when the children of Israel murmured and complained and turned on him, he still put God first and did what God wanted him to do. He never gave up, though he was uh, faced tremendous opposition. Chances are, when we're called to leaders, uh, to leadership in these roles in our lives, wherever they are, we're going to face opposition too. You know, the devil's always opposing the, the righteousness that happens in the church. Uh, there's never service that the devil doesn't come to. He's always ready to sow discord and temptation and cause problems among the Lord's people. He's always ready and trying to do that. Now, God says if we, uh, if we resist the devil, he'll flee from us. That's true individually as well as as a congregation. We've got to be on the Lord's side. We've got to, we can never give up despite opposition. One of the ways that the devil tries to undermine our leadership in the home is by what he teaches our children out there in the world. Most of the time, our children are hours in the school system compared to what we have at home. The, the time that we have them at home is so precious and so limited to teach them in God's way because they're not going to learn that at school. They're not going to learn that out there in the world. The devil's going to make sure of that. And so our job is to persevere through opposition, just like Moses did. You know, and then finally, this morning... Moses was a man who kept the focus on God and His glory. There was plenty of opportunity for him to, to brag about the great job that he had done leading God's people. He saved them over and over and over again. Remember when uh, the children were murmuring and complaining and God sent fiery serpents in among them? And then God called to Moses and said, I want you to make a serpent of brass and put it up on a pole so that when everybody who's bitten by the serpent looks at it, he can, he'll be saved. Moses did what God told him to do and made a way for all those people to be saved. And that's just one example of many, many examples where Moses helped save the children of Israel from the, from the terrible punishments that God had in store for them. He kept the focus on God and on His glory. Exodus chapter... 33 in verse number 9, it says, It came to pass, as Moses entered the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. Isn't that amazing that that same pillar of cloud that led the children of Israel through the desert during the day, and the pillar of fire that led them through the desert in the night, rested there in the tabernacle and the glory of God came and God talked with Moses there, his man, his leader among the children of Israel. Moses was a man who talked with God face to face. He kept the focus on God and God's glory. And he told the children of Israel countless times, you better focus on your father. You better focus on the God that called you out of Egypt and that saved you over and over and over again. To Moses, it was all about God's glory. You know, he was busy every day with all the duties that he had. At times, he was overwhelmed and called helpers and judges out of the children of Israel to help him to govern God's people. He continually returned, though, to God's presence and sought God's wisdom and depended on, on God's glory. He always 
held up God and put him on the pedestal that he deserved. He made mistakes along the way. You know, there was a, uh, there was a time when Moses was told to speak to the rock and instead he struck it in anger. There were times he failed along the way. But when leaders fail, they have to get up and dust themselves off and get back, get back on course. And that's what Moses was able to do. He trusted in God and focused on God's will and glorifying his heavenly father. And that's exactly what happened. So what can we learn from Moses? Humility and meekness. Great vision for the future, not just thinking about today. Concern and compassion for others. Persevering through great opposition and keeping the focus on God and on his glory. That will help us as we lead God's people in whatever capacity we have. Maybe you're just the, lead, the leader of your family, the leader of your children at home. Maybe you lead in the church in Bible classes or in some other part of worship. Maybe you're an elder overseeing the congregation. Look to Moses and his great example. And it will make you better. The word of God will make you better. It will make you stronger. It will make you more faithful. And if we can uh, help you today, we want to do that. It may be that you're not a Christian. You want to obey the gospel before it's too late. The plan is very simple. It's the same plan that's been taught since the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Not because we teach it, because the Bible teaches it. The Bible teaches that is the way to true forgiveness. That is the way to be added to the church by the Lord. Acts 2 and verse 47. And if you're here as a Christian, you realize you've sinned and stepped out of the footsteps of Jesus. Maybe you haven't put the glory of God first in your life like Moses did. Now's the time to come back through repentance and prayer. And if we can pray with you and for you this day, we'll be happy to do that. Please, please, whatever you do, don't leave here lost. If we can help you, let us know right now as together we stand and as we sing. Have my thunder, sorrow, and night, Jesus, I come. Since Halloween, and so he's been battling among other things, uh, ear 
infections and other problems. So, uh, so pray for him if you would. He sent word. He loved the prayers of the church here to Daresville. He really loves this group of folks. And so pray for him. Uh, and also, uh, you might know that it's Bert's birthday today. And I see that he is 15. Boy, he's 51. <laughs> so uh, happy birthday, Bert. We're uh, thankful for you and for all you mean uh, to the church here. And uh, that's all that I have. Be sure to come back tonight and join in with us as we worship God uh, again this evening. <coughs> We have a lot of strife going on in the world, and we ask that we, we are able to do something to help people find you. And we ask that some of the wars, all the wars can end, that people stop dying, that we can find peace. Father, those that we pray for previously in our, our congregation, brothers and sisters close to us and remote, far away, that we can help support them and bless them with the challenges that they have in life, financial help, and others. Thank you so much, Father, for sending your son to die for us, for the rest of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.